Welcome to the Jill on Money podcast. It is November 1st, Sunday. Yeah. Uh, hopefully you're going to have a little bit of a relaxing Sunday. Maybe you do something fun with your family, with your friends, go take in a walk. This part of my interview with Sharon Epperson, who is the senior personal finance correspondent at CNBC, it goes real personal. And this is a wake up moment for all of us. You've got to hear what happened in Sharon Epperson's life to understand why she is the way she is today. So here is the rest of our interview with Sharon Epperson. I hope you enjoy it. If you have questions about your own financial life, don't hesitate to send us an email. It's askjill at jillonmoney.com. Here's Sharon. I am, of course, going to ask you about this seminal moment in your real life in 2016. So can you tell us a little bit about what happened to you in terms of your health and what that meant to you, you know, sort of going forward in your career? So in uh, September of 2016, I was um, going to the, I was at the gym one day at, at a workout studio and I was, um, I'm not a super athletic person, but I was doing a yoga pose and I felt this really strange sensation in my head. It, it hurt a lot. It was not exactly like a normal headache. I don't get migraines. I just didn't know what it was. And I knew that I had to get out of that studio. And so I went to my car and then I realized I couldn't really turn my neck. I wasn't really in a position to drive. And I texted my husband and I said, "This something's not right. I need you to pick me up. And I did it in all caps and I think I didn't spell things right. So then he knew there was something really wrong with me. And he came uh, to pick me up and took me home. Um, and note to everyone, that is not where we should have gone. I should have gone straight to ER, but I didn't know what it was. I had no idea. So I went home, put my feet up. He went and got me Starbucks. He came back. I still felt horrible. He's like, you know, tell work you're not coming in and I'm taking you to the doctor. And my primary care physician was not there that day. And the person who saw me did the absolute right thing. He said he thought of the worst case scenario. He had been an emergency room physician and he said, you need to go straight to the hospital. At that point, I was kind of in and out of consciousness. I was nauseous. I, you know, things that, you know, as a um, mom of, a te- of two teens who do sports, I know like, did I have a concussion? But I didn't do anything that would have had a concussion. You know, those are some of the symptoms that, that I look out for for my kids and when they're, when they're doing sports. When I got to the hospital, the first hospital, I was at three during this time, but when I went to the first hospital and they did a CT scan, the emergency room doctor said that they saw bleeding in the brain. I was like, what, how, I I couldn't even understand how that could happen. But what I knew was that I had to call my sister and let her know. And I did. And I told her not to tell my mom. We're all very close to that. Would, of course, right. You're laughing because we are kindred. So you know that. (laughs) Right. That's like the first call she probably made. And uh, the next thing I know, I was uh, at another hospital where I had to have emergency surgery. I vaguely remember the anesthesiologist putting me under and I felt like I was in good hands for some reason. And I was because I woke up and my husband was there and my sister had come up from D.C. and the doctors and nurses were around me and I and I made it. I made it through a ruptured brain aneurysm, which is basically a balloon um, on one of the vessels of your brain uh, that explodes, literally. It just pops like a balloon. And it was on the, the one of the main arteries in my brain. So, you know, it de- definitely did some damage. Um, and I had to learn how to walk again. I was able to talk. <laughs> Since I'm a talker, that's a good thing. But I did have to practice walking, um, learn about balance, had to learn how to ba- balance a checkbook again, you know, or just kind of how to figure that kind of stuff out. It was a long road of therapy. I was in hospitals for about a month. And then I was doing outpatient rehab for several months and I did not work for a year. So, um, and I really, really toyed with, not toyed with, that makes it sound like it was easy or, or fun. I really grappled and struggled with the idea of, can I go back to work? How can I go back to work? Who is going to go back to work? And so I say who, because the person who came back in 2017, in the fall of 2017, was not the person who left that day in in September of 2016. You know, I think I have renewed passion and renewed purpose for what we do, Jill, as personal finance journalists. And it's because what I went through was not only a healthcare emergency, it could have been a significant and devastating financial emergency if I hadn't actually done what 
my own financial advisor and so many people that we interview and that sources that we have have talked about and stories that I've done over the years. And so if I hadn't done things like made sure that I took advantage of the health insurance policy that, that my uh, my husband has, I'm actually on his policy, but um, make sure that we had disability insurance, that I have disability insurance, mm-hmm. or that all of our finances are on autopilot so that my wonderful husband could be in the hospital 24-7 and let mail pile up to high heaven in the house and still have the lights on and the mortgage paid and make sure that I had people in place that I was comfortable making those decisions that, you know, I mean, many people would expect, of course, where her spouse or her partner made all those decisions. But I had that legally outlined that he would be the person and that my sister would be the second person to do that. And they worked as a team in making medical decisions um, and, you know, and doing some of the financial decisions around my care also. So all of those things could have been so devastating. And so now, as I look at where we are, I've been in the situation where your life turns upside down, your life stops, you know, nothing is as you thought it would be. And that's what many people are feeling right now during this pandemic. You know, I urge people all the time is to think about what you can control. I had no control over when this aneurysm was going to rupture. I had no idea that family history is is a precursor for this, and I should have paid more attention to that. I just didn't think about those things. But I did focus on what I could control, which is I'm a journalist, you know, and I cover learning about how to organize and and manage your finances and grow your finances. And and that's what I, I try to do in my own life. And so when this type of adversity hit, I had something to fall back on that I could control. That helped me in, in in my recovery to know that my kids could still do the sports they were doing, do the lessons that they were doing. Um, we were able to take a family vacation right before I went back to work. We had savings to be able to do that. And I know that healthcare emergencies and medical crises can be financially devastating, even if you do have some savings, because it is just such an extraordinarily expense if you don't have proper insurance and all of those things. But that's why it's so important to have it in place now. When you're listening to Jill tell tell you about, you know, things that are happening and, and or whatever media outlet you listen to and you and you see numbers of deaths or numbers of cases of people getting sick. It just may seem to you to be numbers if you haven't been touched by that. And 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 I hope many of you have not. But if you have, and if it does happen, what would you do? I tell my story often because I want people to realize that I was at the top of my game, traveling around the country, filling in for different anchors, just so busy in my in my career, thinking I was building this brand that, you know, would be so great. And then my life stopped full stop for almost a whole year. So it's very important to think about what you can control because there are times when things will happen that you will have no control over whatsoever. So I'm listening to you tell the story and I'm sort of also wondering how it must have felt going back to work after going through that. And then, you know, really focusing on you are a proselytizer about control what you can control. It makes so much sense. How do you manage the feeling of wanting to do that and also being in this bubble called CNBC, which is, you know, listen, it's it's a great and powerful network, but there is a lot of that network that is so hyper-focused on just making money. And that cannot be your motivator because you obviously, there's a million different things you could have done And it couldn't have just been like, oh, you know what? I had a brain aneurysm. Let me tell people to make money. So how do you feel managing the paradox of where you work versus what your passion is? You know, the cliche that has become so ubiquitous about, you know, your authentic self. What is your authentic self? Are you authentic in in your workplace or in your your professional and your personal life? That was what I grappled with. How do I come back? Do I come back? you know, oh, I'm fine. You know, I went through that period. I lost my dad. I've I've been through so much at CNBC. CNBC really is my family. I have, uh, you know, got married, had two kids, lost my dad, lost my, almost lost my life, all within work in the time I've worked at CNBC. And I remember after my dad passed away, coming back and being like, I'm good. I'm good. You know? And then I would be in that elevator at the NYMEX bawling. Just so like, how am I doing? The, you know, do a live shot, come off. And just, I was just, I was just devastated. And I didn't want to be that way. And I must say, coming back, 
after, um, you know, my brain injury, I never had one of those moments because I kind of came back real the whole time. And I must say, this is another lesson learned. Your doctor is your partner, you know, your doctor is your, your partner in your medical journey, but also in your professional journey. So I documented everything. I'm not just telling you this is what happened to me. Here is the documentation from my physician. Here is what my physician says I can do. And I think that, you know, it, I'm not saying every employer will would adhere to this. Some of my doctors say CBC is pretty outstanding in, in the support that they've given me. Um, and I believe that to be true as well. But I do have documentation says how long I can work. I, I returned to full-time work. So I came back to CNBC in 2017, in September of 2017. I returned to working full-time at CNBC in March of this year during a pandemic. You know, I'm never, I've never presented it as woe as me, but I've always presented it as this is what I can do and this is what I can't do. And what I can do, I do 110% because that's just in my DNA. I don't know how to kind of not, how to ratchet that down at all. But when I have to stop, I have to stop. And so there was a period early on where literally my brain would just stop. Like it could not process anymore, had to be done. So I had to work within certain time constraints for that to happen. And now I've kind of figured out better how to do that. I mean, there is an audience that loves what CNBC does, that wants to know how to make money. And if I can interject in there. That's great. Make as much money as you can, but make sure you're covering these other basic things. It's not, you can make all that money and lose it in an instant if you haven't planned for some other things. You know, you're you're, you're making all this money, but you haven't protected a dime of it. And and what I'm witnessing, again, so fascinating during this pandemic is sources, friends, people I've just, you know, followed who seem to be at the very top of their game and making a ton of money now because something in March, they were just so margined, you know, when the market went crazy, they lost everything or lost a lot and they're not able to get it back. Why? Because everything was invested in a way that was all about risk and not about protection. You know, if when I can interject some semblance of those types of tenants of personal finance and of just you know, managing your money responsibly. I I try to do that. Okay. Thanks so much to Sharon Epperson because what a delight to talk to her. She's a class act. Check out her work at CNBC. It's really terrific. If you are feeling nervous and anxious about your financial life, don't forget to get in touch with us. Take that anxiety and put it on us. We can help you out. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. And if you wouldn't mind, could you please give us a rating or a review or maybe just send this podcast to someone who you think could benefit from it? All right, wash your hands, wear your masks, maintain your physical distancing, and do something nice for someone else today. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Tomorrow.